Welcome to the Executive Lounge with me and Shira Addo. This is your business thought leadership program that brings you nuggets of insights from the life and experiences of men and women who are busy scaling the daunting heights of either starting their own businesses or growing institutions both here at home and around the world. Our guest today is a man who has expressed his passion in several different fields. He's traversed the high-octane world of advertising and brand development. Uh, he's uh, also a pro photographer, a good storyteller, and a lay preacher. We're going to learn more about my guest, Nana Kofi Aqua, of Nana Kofi Aqua Photography. Welcome to the Executive Lounge. Thank you, Insura. It's a pleasure to be here. It's quite interesting. I'm just realizing that you are a man of many parts. How did you find your passion in different places and still be able to manifest them well? Uh, I think it's two things. Uh, one is being honest with yourself uh, and knowing that we, we are all wired and created differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, by being honest with yourself, uh, so I would have a job and um, I'm a stickler for excellence. So I would thrive to be the best at what I do. And then after a while, it gets boring. <laughs> so once it gets boring, I'd have to find the next call. Wow. Know, to find the next thing to do, which I would also, first you struggle to, to master it because it's a, it's a totally new thing. And then after you master it, you do it for a while and then it gets boring and then <laughs> have to move on. So I never set out to say that I'm going to have a career that cuts across uh, different fields. Uh, no, I... I just wanted to live a life that, that was meaningful for me, and, and, and this is how it's turned out to be. So somewhere along the line, you got bored with doing brands and advertising and decided you were going to go into photography. Yeah, okay, so first, so when I was a student uh, in the University of Cape Coast, uh, I worked on radio, so I was a campus radio <laughs> presenter, <laughs> and then from there I went to Sky Power FM as a radio presenter. And, but before that, you know, I used to paint. So A-level and before that, I, I was always painting. And when I worked in radio, I felt that the visual part of me was dying. You know, it's, it's great to be on radio, great to, to, to deliver on radio, but coming from a visual art background also, I felt this part of me is dying. What mm -hmm. do I do about it? And then somebody talked to me about advertising and how the advertising world would give me opportunity to work with graphic designers and storyboard artists and you know art directors and creative and i thought wow this is interesting for the first time in my life i can find an industry that would allow me to use both my uh, visual art part and my oral you mm -hmm. know being a radio person my vocals in the same space and that is what drew me to advertising. Mm. But, you know, you start, so I started as a copywriter trainee, uh, worked my way to be creative director at some point, and then I got to this stage where all I wanted to do was photography because it spoke to me in ways, maybe it was my way of getting in touch with a, with a painter in me mm -hmm. uh, because I also paint. <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, but, but, but this is where, and then when it got to this place where Photography was all I wanted to do. I knew that I had to be honest with myself mm -hmm. and, uh, and leave the world of advertising and, 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 and just be a photographer. Was there a moment when you finally decided to make the move that, or after, soon after you made the move, that you had doubts and say, well, why have I walked away from this thing I love so much? It's difficult. I mean, so at the time I was moving from advertising to photography, I had a wife and a child. Mm -hmm. Um, you still do have a wife. And three children now. Okay. <laughs> but, oh. <laughs> but back then I only <laughs> had a wife and a child. And I couldn't really, you know, my, my, my motivation wasn't financial. It wasn't money driven. Mm. So I hadn't figured out how I was going to live off photography yet. Mm. You know, I hadn't done the wise thing. I mean, I wouldn't advise anybody to do that. but. I personally tend to be more passion driven mm -hmm. than money driven. Uh, the challenge with that is that sometimes you start doing it and now you're like, okay, I'm enjoying it. How do I make money out of yeah. this? When smarter people would say, uh, can that bring money before they even move? Mm -hmm. you know? So I think the biggest hurdle to overcome was fear. In fact, 
when I left Low Linters, which was the agency I started with, and moved to TBWA as creative director, mm -hmm. the main reason why I switched agencies wasn't because I wanted to work in an, another ad agency. It was because I left to do photography, and then all of a sudden I was faced with the reality of maintaining a, a standard of living and you know keeping a family. But the good thing was I got to TBWA, and then about a year later I got fired. For, re for some reason, later I discovered it was because they couldn't afford to pay me. And then, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, at, at the time of getting fired, it was a totally different excuse. Yes. You know, and it was good relief when one day I was told, oh, we can have you back now because now we can afford to pay you. I'm like, oh, I've moved on. You know. Oh, wow. but, yeah, but it was, it was a wonderful, uh, not wonderful, it was quite a traumatic move, but it is one I would do again. You know, because uh, I think the older we get, the more we lose our courage to move. You know, the beautiful thing with childhood is that <laughs> death is, you know, no child thinks about death. Mm. Death feels very far away. So mm. children and young people tend to feel invincible. And, and that is a beauty. You know, when you feel invincible, courage is easy. And now that I have three children and settled, it's, I think it will be easier now to to leave a prestigious job title and, and, and to say I'm going to uh, start something new totally from scratch. Wow. Interesting times. I mean, so you quit, um, well, you moved agencies and then you left. And, and at, at what point did you fully decide that, okay, I'm going to take all the lessons I've learned in advertising, I'm going to throw that into and, and I'm talking more the business side of advertising, that I want to take that, I want to throw that into the mix of my passion for the visual arts and do photography full time and make money out of it. So the good thing with working in advertising and being an executive creative director at some point is that your job description wasn't to come up with fancy ideas. My job, descri my job description was to look at the client's, I, I mean, the client's brief, so the problem they need solved, the money available, the money they are capable of spending to get the problem solved, mm -hmm. and then the creative ideas that will fit the budget. So if, for example, the creative team come up with a concept that would mean that a crew would have to fly in from Chicago and would need to rent uh, the Pediasi Lodge for two weeks and we need a chopper and the, your budget goes up. You know? So the ability to look at a creative idea and say that this idea will fit in the budget and this will not. But being exposed to clients' budget also came with an education. I knew that clients could afford to pay a, a bit. You know? <laughs> so, so what I didn't uh, lack was the courage to ask. You know, in fact, uh, years before I'd worked this TV program where the youngest female president of a music uh, studio, uh, I, I don't know if it was Sun, one of these music uh, labels, and she was asked, how did you manage to succeed so quickly as a woman in, in an industry that is very macho? And she said, I have just one principle, and it is ask. Mm. She said, if I'm at zero, and I ask, and I get a yes, I move to one. If I get a no, I stay at zero. I haven't lost anything. So for her, to ask is the easiest thing. Mm. And she ask, always asks with this question in her mind, what if I get a yes? Mm. If I get a yes, I get to progress. So she always asks. And, and I think that helped me. You know? The other thing with asking is that once you ask a client for good money, they expect you to deliver good work. So I say that the real university of photography for me, I mean, now you have photographers all over, but at the time, I was actually educated by clients, mm -hmm. you know, because if you had, back then, if you had clients like Getty Images and, and Nestle, when I talk Nestle, I'm talking the head office in, mm -hmm. in Vive, uh, sending you briefs, you know, they come with such strict requirements that you have no option than to learn, you know. Uh, sometimes it meant flying to Holland, paying a pro, 480 euros a day to train to you, to mm -hmm. learn. Uh, sometimes it meant traveling to Holland three times in a year to attend uh, school, to school in Groningen on, in photography, because I had decided that if this is what I want to do, if this is what I claim to have passion for, I'm going to be the best. I'm not going to be the best in Ghana. I'm not going to be the best in Africa. 
I'm going to be the best. Clients would have to choose me, not because I'm cheap, not because I'm at a location. They have to choose me because when they look among the photographers available to them, one of the best they can find is this African who happens to live on the continent, who happens to be familiar with the, with, with the location. You know, and once you set those parameters high, you have no other choice than to push. You know, and, and, and this has been my journey uh, with photography. Let's backtrack a little bit uh, back to your days in advertising. So you started off as a copywriter trainee. What would you say from that point to becoming an executive uh, creative director? What were some of the key lessons that you learned along the way? And uh, like, what would you say was a monumental moment of learning? You know, uh, where did you fall hardest and what did you take away from I'll it? I'll tell you right from the beginning. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so when I, remember when I was advised that maybe advertising would be a good fit for me, mm -hmm. I had no idea about the world of advertising. Wow. Well, I thought I did because I worked in radio and we used to, you know how in the radio you, you have, play the you'd, you'd have a studio B, not even play. You record, you do voiceover uh -huh. for, you know, somebody will bring some product and then you do some voiceover and, and you think you're doing advertising. And then when you work in radio, you tend to get a big ego because you have all these people who call you and tell you how great your voice is and how amazing <laughs> your program is. So you, you tend to feel big, you know, and, and I had that big ego. And then I show up at Low Lintas at the time and... I meet this guy and he says, what, what do you want? You know, I mean, I think God placed him there as an angel. His name is Mr. Kwafo. He's still there with a, a, a media initiative. And he asked me, what do you want? I said, well, I, I, want a, I want a job here. I want to work in advertising. He said, what do you want to do in advertising? And I was standing there. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. And he said, OK, what's your background? What do you do now? Where are you coming from? So to think that he even had time for me. You know, once I got to know the industry and saw how busy everybody's life was, to think that he met this total stranger, this young guy, who came with a big ego, and he had to, that, even that was a miracle. So he listened to me and he said, I think you'll be a good copywriter. Because remember, I, I have a degree in English from the University of Cape Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd worked in radio. So he thought, well, you obviously can write. And, yeah, <laughs> so you can, you'll be a copywriter. So he showed me who the creative director was, pointed me to the office. I went knocking and Colin Charles was like, hey, how may I help you with this British accent? <laughs> and he said, what you? I said, I want to be a copywriter. You know, I had only heard the word just two minutes before I got up the stairs. I didn't know what a copywriter was. And then I get there and then he says, okay, I'll give you an assignment. And then he gives me this assignment and I'm sitting there feeling totally useless. I have a degree in English. I'm supposed to write an advert. In English? In English. And I thought I spoke quite well. And I was sitting there looking at a blank sheet of paper and I had no idea what to do. Wow. But Colin was generous. He picked a book off his shelf on advertising, on copyright, and gave it to me. And he said, go take this book, go home, read it, and then do the assignment and bring it back. <laughs> you know? But I didn't hear from them again. You know, I think I did the assignment and gave to him. And then six months later, I get a phone call that I should come for an interview. So I show up at the interview thinking they were going to interview me for, for a copywriter. I show up and I think, uh, no call, Barbara, you know, I mean, great team. Lintas yeah. is an amazing agency. They're sitting there and they're like, okay, so we're looking for an account manager, account manager. And I said, no, I'm not interested in account management. <laughs> I want to be a copywriter. They're like, no, uh, we don't have vacancy for a copywriter. If you're interested in account, I said, no, I don't want to be an account manager, in account management. I want to be a copywriter. And then at some point, Noko was like, you know, we hardly ever run into young people who know exactly what they want to do. So they set up the interview to employ one person, but they ended up employing two people. So they employed me for a position they thought they, they, didn't, they didn't need, need, you for. <laughs> need me for. And then employed uh, Ikuba for, for, for account management. You know, but, but this was my early days. And... It was very humbling. I remember you get there, you know, you go to school, you read some Shakespeare, you read some Chaucer, you read some Keats, you know, and some Amata Edu, you know, and you think you're educated. And then you end up in a good ad agency. And I was very fortunate. Normally, most people who end up in the creative studio end up with a creative director who comes from design. Most creative directors in the ad agencies come from, have, when I say they come from design, they have graphic design backgrounds. Mm -hmm. 
I was so fortunate that Colin Charles came from a copy background. It doesn't get better than that. To get a copywriter who has risen to become creative director, and then you happen to be an, you know, a trainee who loves copy. So it was the same guy who introduced me to photography. <laughs> you know? And I was like, yeah, finally. I don't get to paint with a brush, but I can paint with a camera. And then it became an obsession. And, then, and, and you know, the rest, they say, is history. Wow. But it's been an interesting journey. You know? And I think the first thing I would want to tell anybody is that a degree, it doesn't matter what degree it is. It can be a degree in medicine, a degree in law. A, a degree is totally irrelevant to the workspace. You know, yes, a degree will make you feel good because you have something most people don't have. You know, you have the paper to show for it. But remember that the paper shows what you've done before. <laughs> not not what you can do now. Workplace is immediate demand. What you can do now or what you can do in the future. The mm. future is totally different. You know, and so people show up with big egos. And I mean, I've had, over the years, I've had the privilege of also mentoring others. And I've watched them come with the same big ego <laughs> and they think they know. And, you know, and at some point, I remember when I would tell people, they, they'll bring some design and they say, eh, this actually doesn't work, looking at the brief and this. Mm. And they'll be upset because they spent two weeks, three weeks, sleepless nights working on it. And, and at some point, if I wanted to be cheeky, I will say, okay, so we'll put a billboard out there. And if anybody drives past and they say they don't get it, you stand under the billboard and explain your concept to them. <laughs> 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 you know, because, so, so advertising quickly teaches you that it's not about you. In spite of all the ego, you have a client who is coming to who has, you know, who is being beaten or being lashed by a competition, and they they have, you know, a million dollars to spend. It is not time for pettiness. It's not time for. I'm not there to massage your ego. It's <laughs> it's not about you. It's about fixing the client's problem. It's about fixing the client's problem. You know, and it teaches you humility. You know, and I mean that line. It is not about you. Is something you hear a lot in a good ad agency. Mm. Because remember, people put true creative people put all their energy into their ideas. They literally burn the midnight oil or whatever. You know, they will stay awake. They will walk a mile, whatever will bring up the ideas, they will do it and they will take their time, push everything into the work. And sometimes it honestly misses the brief, you know. And we unfortunately, in this industry, we don't have time to baby people, you know. I, I know yes, I know you've lost the, you know, we, we have to drown your idea. Mm -hmm. It's your baby. We have to <laughs> come up with another <laughs> one. <laughs> but we have to do it quickly and move on with it. And some people just can't move on that quickly. You know, it, it can get very antagonistic, mm. you know. Uh, but it's not about you. It's not personal. How, how did you, how were you able to, and, and of course, people will have different temperaments. So some might bounce back quickly with, and come up with a new idea. Some people will sulk a little too long. From the experience and the mentoring you received, how were you able to get people who especially were difficult to bounce back to still become good at what they did? So you work in teams. Uh, and it's how you design your team. So normally, and, and also what I used to do actually was to be backup. Mm. Myself as backup. So once I know that this team is struggling or might struggle, I end up taking the brief and working on it myself at home. So if we have a presentation, I'd actually have a backup concept. <laughs> if, if the client doesn't, and sometimes you can tell if, if it won't go well, I would have other concepts I'll present. The idea isn't to get a client to buy. The idea is to get the client to get a sense that the team is busy working on it. That's an uh, interesting and uh, insightful uh, experience. We're going to jump into more photography. I mean, you've done work for global brands. You've traveled the world doing photography. And I'm going to pick your brains on some of the things you've picked. I mean, I hear that we're all the same at the core. We'll find out whether that's true. Stay tuned. This is the Executive Lounge. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me in Shirado and my guest Nana Kofi Aqua. Uh, very insightful conversations uh, being had. Uh, we've talked a bit about his journey through starting off as uh, wet behind the ears, copywriter growing up to an executive creative director's um, position. And then 
Um, totally walking away from advertising and then doing photography. Now, one of the striking things about your work is that you weave words and images. Like you have every photo has a nice little paragraph of very poignant uh, observation or thoughts attached to it. Do you find that, and this is probably a leading question, but do you find that your time doing advertising and copywriting lends itself to what you're doing now? It does. I mean, to be fair, it does. Uh, because I think that, um, you know, my... So I tell people that I'm a storyteller who finds photography as a great medium. Uh, and my first love with, with all the, of, of, all, of all the art forms was actually poetry before I discovered painting, mm. you know. And so uh, it makes sense that if I'm writing for people, I mean, I take photos. It's, it's okay to write a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I think initially I started writing because, um, remember, years back when I worked in advertising, I noticed when we did a fantastic campaign, people always thought some crew from abroad came to film it or the concept was borrowed from somewhere. And I was always frustrated at the idea that, listen, are you saying we are not good enough that we can do it? So in 2007, I started a blog called A Window to Ghana in Africa. Mm -hmm. I think that blog, uh, a lot of people who practice photography and video I meet today were students at Ashesi or uh, Nafti or Tech. And they're like, oh, you know, your blog used to educate us a lot. It didn't set out, I didn't set out to educate or anything. Mm -hmm. But I think hearing stories from somebody who looks like them from somebody you know who lives where they live was was inspiration you know and so if i have the gift of writing and the visual ability to photograph it makes sense to to put them together you know uh, in fact i've had i've heard people argue that i'm a better writer than i am a photographer <laughs> and this is normally the argument by other photographers right you know and then i meet those who also say that it is my photography that they like, mm. not my writing. Uh, but I'm happy that I can, I can, I can give both. I think for me, I, 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 like, I like to read, and, and I do love the idea of writing. So, uh, and I love photography. Um, when I look at the composition of an image and then I see the text that follows and goes with it, it kind of, for me, gives me a window into what you were feeling at the time you took the photo. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yes, the picture will tell its own story, but then the text also gives you another of layer of, of um, you know. But so you've done some very remarkable work. You've done stuff for the Global Fund. You've um, you covered uh, e the immediate aftermath of uh, Ebola in Liberia. Yes. I was in Liberia. What were you and, drinking? And, and, and I mean, what were you drinking? Why did you? How do you decide to just jump into a space like that? That's a scary thing to do. You know, well, you know. So even before Ebola, I'll tell you about. So last year in November, I ended up in the north of Mali, Gundam. <laughs> uh, Gundam is in the Timbuktu district. So to give Ghanaians a sense of the Timbuktu, Timbuktu district, it's bigger than Ghana. So when we talk about the, the district is or, bigger or the than region, the, the region, region, region is, is bigger, bigger than, than Ghana. It's bigger than okay. Ghana. So right. it's, a, it's a huge vast space where the government is totally missing, <laughs> totally absent. And you have, at the time, about eight different jihadist groups fighting for territory. And then a lot of bandits and armed robbers. And then there's a medical team that was struggling to save lives there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Medicine Some Frontier or some, it was an African uh, a medical team, Alima, and nobody wanted to go. Somebody had to tell the story, and nobody wanted to go. So finally, even though I'm Anglophone, well, I've worked in Francophone Africa many times, but you know, I had to go. You know, and I remember my wife asking me, "Why do you want to go? Why are you?" Go? I said, "Because somebody has to go." Is that a way? Was that question supposed to say, "No, no, don't go"? Of course, of course. I mean, when you hear the stories and the feedback, and you know, on the Friday I left Mali, the team I went to work with was attacked. Wow! It wasn't a joke, and you know, <laughs> but somebody has to go. And this is the you have to remember that even though I came from advertising, before I got into advertising, I worked in radio, mm -hmm. where I got introduced to journalism. 
So there has always been a part of, the, the big shift in my photography was that I moved from advertising commercial photography to documentary journalistic photography. It was a huge shift. It meant that I stopped chasing certain kind of jobs, stopped working for certain kinds of clients. Normally these were the very high paying clients, but money was not, money has never been a motivator for me. So once you work as a documentary photojournalist, once you work in this space, you have to go. It is mandatory. You know, um, I was in Sierra Leone and Liberia for Ebola mm -hmm. because immediately the World Health, the WHO declared that Ebola was over. Everybody started pulling out. Everybody was tired. It had been extremely stressful. But there, there, there were so many loose ends that hadn't been tied. You know? So say somebody survived. What does it mean? What does life mean for them now? You know, so basically, I went to make sure that we didn't forget too quickly, you know. And um, it's, we'll talk about the effect of these, these assignments later, mm. uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and all that. But, but when you get into those spaces and you hear people's stories, you see why it is crucial that we go. And unfortunately, a lot of Africans who are interested in photography and videography are not interested in these, you know, this kind of work because it is hard. Why do you think that they don't tend to go after that? Is that because they're lower hanging fruits? Yeah, weddings. A wedding is a lower hanging fruit. You get fed, you eat good meals, uh, you take photos of people in their good clothes. Uh, you get paid a lot of money. Compare that to <laughs> sitting in a vehicle for eight hours on... When you live in Ghana, it's hard to describe certain roads to you because your idea of a bad road is actually not the worst kind of road. I'm talking about a road where a road in a forest where the vehicle just hops from one side to the other and you have to cross quickly before it gets dark because then it is not safe. And then your vehicle breaks down in a stream and you have malaria and you are feverish and an ambulance is sent to rescue you and then the ambulance arrives in the forest by 10 p.m. and the ambulance driver is like, let's go. And the ambulance has no shocks. In fact, it's, you know, those hard Toyota, uh, 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 what do you call them? The Haze or the Hilux? No, not the Hilux, the, the, the Safari. Okay. The ugly, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the ugly Land Cruisers. That's right. But without, you know, without seating, it's, it's empty space because it's an ambulance. It's made for beds. Only there is no bed in it and there is no seat in it. So you're on the hard floor. You're on the hard floor and no the vehicle absorption. has no shocks. And you're driving through a forest in Liberia. Liberia, you know, uh, <laughs> in John Logan Town. A country even Liberians, a county that even Liberians don't know exists in their country because it's somewhere in the forest. Wow. And the driver is panicking because it's not safe and he has to get you to your hotel. And, you know, your, your fever is breaking <laughs> from Mali. I mean, how many of us would want to do that? But it is important that somebody goes, you know. <laughs> so you do all these. Uh, and, 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 and in moments like that, what runs through your mind? You're like, you know, <laughs> why did I decide to do this? You know? And then, but you know that the truth is that you come back and then it takes you a while to recover. But then you have to go again. And unfortunately, and this is not for me, this is for photojournalists or documentary photographers all over the world. Uh, in the U.S. now, there's a lot of, a lot of support for soldiers mm -hmm. who fight in war. So there's a lot of attention on post-traumatic stress disorder. But it's also a reality that affects the journalists who go along with them. Yeah. And maybe even more so because we tend to be lonely mm -hmm. figures. You know, we, we work in isolation, unlike soldiers that work together as a team. When, when a, a photojournalist is, is on, out there, they are normally out there alone. You know, we, they, they call us solitary spiders. Mm -hmm. So you get exposed to all these experiences, and then when you come back, you have to edit, and you live with them. You have to share the stories. You live with these realities. And after a while, so, I mean, typically if I throw you into a room of documentary photojournalists, you'd see that a lot of them are a bit... Off. <laughs> I mean, you know, because it's, they've seen too much. They've seen more than a person should see. Uh, let me share a story. To, to, so, for example, in Sierra Leone, I had to get to uh, 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 Koindu. Koindu is 
shares a border with Guinea. So the first person to get infected so in the zero, yeah. So I went to her hut. She, she was a, a herbalist. Mm. You know, she was a herbalist. And this person had Ebola in Guinea, and the family sneaked her to this woman's hut. Now, because she's a herbalist and she was powerful and respected, when she got infected, other herbalists, and remember these are the community leaders in, in rural uh, uh, Sierra Leone, they all came to perform. They have this ritual they perform. And in the process of performing the ritual, all these other people got infected and they all took it to their it community. So this is how Ebola spread so rapidly. In, 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 in Sierra Leone so rapidly. And then you meet somebody who says, oh, you know, my wife was the first person to be declared medically, has having medically recovered from Ebola. You're like, fantastic. And you ask, how many family members did you lose? You said, oh, I lost 14, my wife lost 21. And no, they sound just like figures. And then he says, oh, but my sister, she had Ebola, she ran into the bush, and she just chewed herbs, and she recovered. And, and this is my sister, and she's right in front of you. And say, so what leaves? She says, potato leaves, other leaves, any leaves I could grab in the forest, in the bush. And then he says, come with me. And he takes you right behind his house. And you know how in Ghana, when we plant yams, we do a mound? Yeah. So you see all these mounds, and you're thinking, is anybody planting yams here? And then he says, oh, this is my mother, and this is my sister, this is my younger sister, this is my father, this is my cousin. And, <laughs> you know, you meet people who tell you, you know, I lost everybody, I lost all my children, I lost my husband. And then one particular lady princess, she said, you know, there were only two survivors in my family, my sister and I. And when, after the Ebola was over, we had no way of surviving, so we became prostitutes on the street. And she said, but even as prostitutes, we were not getting customers. Because all the other girls had to tell their guys is that they had Ebola. For the first time in my life, I was meeting somebody who had sunk so low that she was even not qualified for prostitution. I had never experienced that before. Normally, in the society I come from, the lowest a woman can sink is that she becomes a prostitute. But to get to a situation in life where even for prostitution, you are not qualified. How low can a person get? Uh, what does that do to you as a man? I know you're a very deep thinker, you love humanity, but what is that, the things you see, uh, how does it make humanity look to you when you look through your, your viewfinder? Uh, there was a quote I, I read, uh, forgotten who said, but he said, be nice to everybody you meet because everybody is fighting some battle. And it spoke to me because I think that, you know, I've had the privilege of photographing presidents and then also photographing in some of the most deprived communities in the same city. And I'll tell you that the good thing is that people are just people. That's amazing. And the pauper and the prince both have their struggles. They both have their sorrows, you know. And this illusion of better is, is just an illusion. There, are, there is no human being on earth who is better than another. No human being on earth who is better. Not morally, not physically, not spiritually. People are just people. And it is the ability to recognize that just because you may have a, a bit of money doesn't mean you have a bit more joy. Because I watch, I've, I've photographed billionaires and millionaires, and I'm talking in dollar terms. And I've watched some of them fight depression, and then you pass through Nima, and the guys are playing their dumb and laughing and drinking like it's no man's business. You know? So even the rich may only be rich in money, but are they rich in peace? Are they rich in joy? Are they rich in health? Mm. Because remember that the difference between the rich and the poor is that the rich can pay to conceal their disease. You know, the poor <laughs> can't afford to conceal it. Mm. So, so, you know, if they have a scratch, you see it. You know, they, <laughs> it shows. But the rich will go to, for example, in this country, there are rich people who also, some rich people who are HIV positive. But then they don't line up for their ARVs. You know, it is delivered to them in their fancy offices. But they're also sick, you know. So people are just people. And it, it's about time we got off our high horses mm. and, and rec recognize that. You know, at the end of the day, 
you know, humans are just humans. Would you say that the travels and the, the stories you've covered and places you've been, um, have you discovered a different identity to what you thought you were? Yeah. How, how has it changed? I think that I have been forced to notice that based on, based on where, how I was brought up, uh, you know, I thought I grew up as a tough guy. I thought life was rough. But I, sh I show up in places and I feel a bit elitist. Wow. Yeah. To my own surprise, you know, because I'll be offered some water I can't drink. So I quickly will pick up a camera and walk around because I look at the color of the water. I'm like, no way, I can't drink this. Some food I can't eat, I struggle to eat. Uh, you know, situations that, that, that make my skin creep. So we're complaining about a lot of things. And, 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 and uh, the, the most recent um, one is the, the perennial floods and the lives we lose, our healthcare system, our roads, power. We seem to have a litany of issues that we complain about. Um, should we feel content with where we are? No. Um, but in a sense, we're doing far better than others. Yes, but we started far better than others. You know, uh, let's be fair. You can't compare Ghana to Togo. You had Nkrumah, they had a Yadima. <laughs> what are you saying? You know, it's based on... The, where we started from, you know, and, and, and that is the point. Am I Ghanaian? Yes. Am I proudly Ghanaian? Oh, I'm very, very proudly Ghanaian. I know how, like, being Ghanaian, how much respect you get in other African countries when you show up as a Ghanaian. I know how, I, I was educated in Ghana. So, like, oh, you did in school in England? I say, no, well, but basically I was educated in Ghana. Uh, you know, so I know that it's a great country. But I also know that looking at, you know, the, the story in the Bible about the seven who was given five talents, you know, so the other countries got one talent. We are the guys who got five talents. And the Bible says to him who, who, who much is given, much, much is required. And, and this is the point. You know, you cannot have a president who is as educated as, as Nana, a cabinet of what, uh, what parliament, you know, how many leaders do we have? Like so, two seventy-five in parliament. Two seventy-five, yeah. Plus. You know, you can't have that many people claiming to be in leadership, and have uh, uh, Nkrumah cycle uh, flood with rubbish. You know, after one rain, uh, you see all the rubbish. Uh, do I expect them to be the ones who go do the cleaning up? No, but but unfortunately, the thing with leadership and culture is that it's one of the few things that goes from up downwards. Many things in life grow, is, 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 has a bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. But culture is totally up-down. If I see, and, and when I say that, you know, it might sound complicated, but think about it. How do Ghanaians show that they've achieved something? By a fancy vehicle. And what kind of fancy vehicle would anybody want to buy? A Land Cruiser. Why would you want to buy a V8 Land Cruiser? Because that is what you see the leaders, you understand? Because the leadership is the mark of achievement. So if, it, if I can dress as they dress, live in the kind of houses they live in, drive the kind of vehicle they drive, I have also arrived. Hmm. They, they, they are the symbol of attainment in every society. So if you have a Gandhi and he will come barefooted or will come in slippers, and you claim to have succeeded in his country, you know that nobody is going to be impressed <laughs> by, by how expensive your, your you know. So, so, so I, I think it's about time. The leadership in this country exemplified uh, values that will help us progress. We've shifted our reward systems from what is important to what is irrelevant, you know. It is shocking that in 2018, mm -hmm. It will rain in Accra, and it will immediately flood. And we will lose medical doctors and other people. And on the medical doctor story, I heard there were 18 soldiers standing there watching her, her drown. And they're like, uh, the water, uh, because they can't swim. And I know soldiers who can swim. 
how do you make it to be a soldier? You don't have to be a Marine. You don't have to be a Navy. Uh, I mean, the ability to swim should be a fundamental requirement if you want to be a soldier. <laughs> because after feeding you in the barracks for all the years, you know, if it floods, we should be able to put you to some good use. So if you can't swim, how did you get there? You know? so, you know, so what do we reward? What do we celebrate? And it's important that as a nation, we stop being political. Uh, so I'm the guy who is always in opposition, <laughs> no matter which government comes. That's right. Uh, but really, all because I know it's capable. I haven't met, you know, the other day I was thinking about it, I haven't met a driven, passionate, capable African entrepreneur, especially from Ghana, who has not been discouraged trying to do business in Ghana. Mm. The ones I've met who are happy, they're doing business elsewhere. Uh, Fretonica seems happy, but then he doesn't do much here. Yeah. You know, the other ones I know who try doing stuff here, they get frustrated. And at some point, they ship out. You know. What is it about the system that makes it so difficult? You know, it's important that we ask these questions mm. and, and answer them genuinely. You know, if you live in a country where a plate of fried rice costs 10 Ghana CDs, and somebody in management earns 2,000 Ghana cities, and they have a wife or a husband, and they have three children, and they pay a rent of 500 Ghana cities a month to live anywhere near the city. It's mm -hmm. that and above, if you have a family. You have to ask yourself how, and, and answer the question honestly, how does this family survive on 2,000 Ghana cities? And when you do the math, you know, it won't compute. You will work it, you will throw in anointing oil, everything. It won't compute. So you know that the only way they survive is by magic. And magic is another word for corruption in this country. Wow. That's a very, very deep uh, uh, analogy. I'm, I'm going to take our final break. And when we come back, I, I would like to, you mentioned culture. I'd like us to explore culture from the perspective of a father. Um, in the whole concept of leadership. Um, are we ever going to be able to get out of this hole that we've plugged ourselves into? This is the executive lounge, and uh, you know you have to stay tuned for the rest. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the executive lounge with me in Shirado, and my guest, Nana Kofi Aqua. He is a journalist, radio presenter, voiceover artist, lay preacher. Uh, photojournalist, uh, what else? <laughs> uh, a father. Proud uh, father. Yes. Uh, and a husband. husband yeah. Yes. Uh, and a man who can't dance just like me. Yes. But it, it's, been, it's been a fantastic conversation. And as we, you know, we're ready to wrap up, I mean, I must be honest with you, suddenly we don't have enough time because there's so much we can talk about. You talked about culture. And, and culture is a very interesting thing. Everyone would say culture is dynamic. Um, I don't know whether we have mastered the dynamism of culture to drive Ghana forward. From the places you've seen, in your own perspective, what are we missing as far as culture is concerned? I think if we want to move Ghana forward and, in, and use culture as a vehicle, what we have to do is get rid of anybody who has been educated in a school, in, in, a, in, in any of our schools. You know, let them set aside and go and bring people who didn't go to school and grew up in our traditional communities. Because our traditional system, African system, raises children for leadership. Mm. Our educational system, which we inherited from the British, raises children for servanthood. So when you take your kids to school, basically the education as we know it started in the 19th century and it was to feed people, you know, basically groom people for their industries. And that's why science and math is important and so you can operate the machine and, and all that. And the arts are not appreciated, you know. But in our traditional societies, the children were raised for leadership. Mm. You know, and so what happens is that, unfortunately, our great-grandfathers <laughs> gave their children to these missionaries to educate them. 
And when their children grew up, all they wanted to be was to dress like white people and speak like white people and act like white people and bow to the queen like white people do. You know, they, they had no inspiration to be authentic, to be genuine. And so you look at the things that define us as Ghanaian, and we talk about the kente. The people who invented the kente they have never stepped in any classroom. They, in fact, anything iconic, very unique about our culture, when they take Ghanaian hospitality, that hospitality is traditional African value, <laughs> where traditionally you'd put water by, by a jar of water by your house. So any stranger who was passing could, could, fetch, could fetch some to drink. It, it was a ritual, you know. And then we get educated, and all we want to do is be like white people, which we'll never be like, and, and be servants. So when you put people in leadership in Africa, and not just Ghana, in Africa, they sit up there, and any affirmation from any white institution if the IMF says they are doing well to them, yes, that's excellent. If the WHO, you know, any affirmation from any Western organization is far more important to them than the feelings and the issues their people are suffering. Because they are not there to please their people. They are, they are there to try and please some, some white people. That's why it's easier for a white person to walk into this culture and meet the president today. And it might take me a month, if I'm lucky, as a Ghanaian, to meet the president. You know, so, so there's a lot that, that has to change. I think we have to go back to our roots, go back to what defined us as a people. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, any time we talk about this, we tend to focus, as a people, we tend to focus on our differences. So he is Ghana and I'm Ewe. He is Hausa and I am this. No, let's, let's come back to have conversations and this time let's focus on our similarities. This is the only way we can raise Africa from, from the grounds up. You know, you raise a very interesting point. Uh, as a child, I remember I had friends who, I mean, now I'm, I'm realizing it wasn't a big deal. It was a guy, um, I can't remember his name, um, Akasumba. That's a nice name. Yeah, Akasumba, I think, was from the Kanjaga tribe. Okay. There's a guy who, to date, we call number two, because when we were playing football, he was number, number two. two. <laughs> um, he was a Khan. Fifi, although it was called Fifi, spoke Ga. Then there was Ashite and then there's, I mean, but neither of us felt different from the other. Yeah. We saw ourselves as friends and, yeah. and we played together and yeah. we did things together. Yes, they would do things differently, yeah. but at least we knew that at Salah time we can go course, over to that place, meat. we'll eat some meat. Mm -hmm. When it's Christmas, they're mm -hmm. over on this side. And I when think, it's from our they get some They get some from, from, from Ashite and Cole's yeah. place, you know. So, at what point did we uh, lose this? Uh, and, and, and maybe you can ignore that, but what can we do to go back? And, and I want your perspectives from a father's. Um, how do we raise the next generation to bring back that cohesiveness that we had once? The, the first thing I would say is that we would have to be deliberate. And I say this as a father of three African children, Ghanaian children, who, who are struggling to speak my mother tongue. Uh, there was never a decision in my house not to speak to my children in our mother tongue. It is just that I forgot that the times had changed. When I was growing up, everybody in my neighborhood spoke Fanti and Ga. You know, so I speak Fanti and I speak Ga and Chi very fluently, effortlessly. And I assumed that my children were still in the same space. So when I went to school, it was the only place where we spoke English. Today, to my shock, I noticed that everywhere my children show up, people speak to them in English. Whether it's at church, on the playground, at school, uh, in family meetings, everybody speaks to them in English. So they come back home and I try speaking to them in Fanti. As for Ghana, I haven't even tried. I try speaking to them in Fanti and they are struggling and they are trying to learn Fanti from a book and it's difficult. You know, so it's, but, but this is, when we understand the principle of seed time and harvest, you understand that colonialism was designed to imprison us, to tell us that something else was better and the seeds were sown. I think that my generation is the last generation of strong Ghanaian influence or African traditional influence where I can speak and write Fanti and Ga smoothly. The generation after me, they'll speak Pidgin, but they can't speak their mother tongue as fluently unless you move to the, the rural parts. And I, I see my children and for the first time, I see a disaster on my hands. Mm. How do I get these children to speak Fanti? not as, uh, to survive, but to speak Fanti 
with such smoothness that they can understand the, the nuances, the intricacies, the beauty of the language, the, the wit. You know, Fancy is such a witty language. How do I get them to, there? Because in there is the identity. You know, if they show up anywhere in the world, who are you? My name is Nanako Fiakwa. I was born in Elmina. My mother is partly Ghan from Usu. This is me. You can speak your, I don't care about your Welsh accent or your New York accent. And, and the confidence I have is, is knowing who I am. Now, if this African child we are raising can't speak Ga and can't speak Chi and can't speak Ewe and can't speak Fula and can't speak Hausa, can't speak Bully, who is he? Who is she? Because she sounds white, but she isn't white. So we, we are creating these creatures that don't fit anywhere. And this is where, as fathers, as parents, we have to become extremely mindful. You know, uh, the next painting, I've got a new canvas. The next painting I'm going to do will just say Kafante, you know, speak Fante, and I'm going to have it in my house. And a time may come when I, I would have to be so aggressive. Anybody who I know speaks a local dialect and comes into my home and speaks English, I, would, I may have to ask them to excuse us. We, have to, we would have to get radical because if, if they lose their identity, I mean, we've lost our gold, we've lost our timber, we've lost our diamonds, we've lost, uh, we owe so much as a nation. If, if we lose our language, <laughs> what well, else do we it. have left? Then we, we have nothing, you know? And so I, I expect leadership, which is fathers and mothers and teachers, Teachers in Ghanaian schools would have to stop speaking to their kids in English. You know, they will learn it from the cartoons anyway. They will learn it from TV anyway. They will learn it from their papers anyway. You know, speak to them in their mother tongue. Let them take pride in who they are. You know, isn't it, I mean, I'm Christian. Uh, you introduced me as a lay priest. But isn't it funny that we'll bow to Jewish ancestors, but not to African ancestors? You know? Mm. We would bow to St. Peter and St. Mary, you know, but we don't know where our grandmother's grave is. We don't know where our grandmother was buried, where our great-grandmother was buried. I'm not saying we, we should go back to traditional worship, but I'm saying that there is something wrong with your mindset when everything you value is foreign. You know, everything you value is somebody else's. So wow. who are you? Wow. Now, that's a good note to end our conversation on. Who are you? And uh, I must say that uh, we'll have to bring you back and, and glean some more from you. The time is just so, so, so short. But Nanako Fiyako, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to it you. It has sure. been for me as well. So my five takeouts from this conversation, number one is that you must remain humble. Humble enough to know when you don't know. And uh, accept the guidance of mentors and people who will point you in the right direction. And that is from Nana's um, first day walking into Loy Linters looking for work and say, hey, uh, I want to work in advertising when he didn't even know the full spectrum of the jobs in advertising. But the willingness and the humility to have someone teach you um, saw him rise through the ranks and run one of the meanest, best teams uh, Loy Linters uh, could boast of and become an executive uh, creative director. At, in the end. Number two is uh, immerse yourself and, and don't just immerse yourself uh, in the things you do by being around people who do it or uh, you know uh, have this fantasy of being the best but actually invest in it. How many people quit their jobs go into a new field and say you know I'm actually going to spend money and travel abroad and go and pay somebody so much money every day just so they can teach me the rudiments of how to make great photography. If you're looking for something, invest in it, else you'll be mediocre. And guess what? Only few people sit at the top of the pile. That means if you want to be one of the best, you have to invest. Number three is that you must have uh, a passion for what you do. Nanakofi clearly has done things that tug at his heartstrings. And it brings fulfillment, takes you on adventures, exposes you to lots of things that people can only hear about, read about, and just dream about. But you can live it because it's from within you. That power of passion when harnessed can bring greatness. Number four is identity. A man who clearly understands that the African story has to be told, good or bad, he finds the silver lining in all the stories that he tells. So know who you are. Answer that question, who am I? Who are you? 
and let that inspire you to do great things. And the final thing I'm taking away from this conversation is that we have a responsibility to the next generation. So don't think that you're going through life and one day you'll be gone. As a matter of fact, your life truly begins when you're gone. Because while you're here, your job is to impact on the next generation. As always, my friends, I'm grateful that you tuned in. I look forward to having you again. And I look forward to having you again on the show, Nana. I look we forward certainly to have to back. do this. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, next time, till then, this has been the Executive Lounge. Go forward, make rain. Shalom.